Hello, it's part five of Open Dog version two. So quite a lot has gone into this series already and we've actually built the whole thing. In part one, I recap my previous dog R&D, including Open Dog version one, my test dogs and mini dog, which walked okay in the end. And now we've got this new version. So in part two, we did a test leg with the same brushless motors to test actually powering up the leg to see what load we could put on so we could design the rest of the dog. And I then went on to refine that design, 3D print all the parts, assemble it. Last time we put the electronics in and powered it up. And this time we're gonna actually make it do some things. But let's have a little recap of how it all hangs together. So all of the joints are quasi-direct drive and that typically means we've got a back drivable reduction of less than 10 to one. In fact, we've got five to one here. So we've got these 92 millimeter brushless motors and that's driving a belt reduction of five to one straight onto the joint there just with pulleys and belts. So in each joint, we've got three motors and three axis. We've got the hip joint here, the shoulder, and then we've also got the knee joint, which is lower down in the leg. And what I've done with the knee joint is left the motor actually up in the shoulder so that the mass doesn't get thrown around when the leg moves, which means it can make some quite fast, agile moves. And we've got this belt drive that comes down to the knee, so all the mass is here around the center of rotation and the leg is as light as possible. Each joint has a position encoder and I'm using the AMS AS5047 magnetic encoders and those both do incremental position and absolute position. And those are linked along with the brushless motors to my O-drives which live in these cages at each end and we've got three O-drives at the front and three at the back. Each O-drive does two motors and we've got 12 in total. And for now our control electronics live in this tray in the middle and we've got a Teensy 4.1 which is an ARM Cortex M7 running at 600 megahertz and it's 32 bit, but we can program it as an Arduino. We've also so far got the Adafruit MPU 6050, which is an inertial measurement unit. We've got a power supply that's separate with a battery and a little regulator that's separate for the electronics so we get a nice clean supply. And thanks again to Cool Components for sponsoring those components in this project. There is one hardware change we need to make before we can continue, but before that, it's just a quick ad for ways you can support the channel, and that really makes all the difference to the projects. I have Patreon and YouTube channel membership, and patrons and YouTube channel members can get access to all the videos up to a week early. And that means, all being well, they've probably got next week's video already. I also have a merchandise store where you can get t-shirts and other merchandise with pictures of things I've built over the years, including Mini Dog 1 and 2, and Open Dog, and various other robots. There's also some affiliate links in the description, and if you use one of those links to sign up for some service or buy something, it won't cost you any more, but I'll get some money. Right, let's have a look at this dog. So I've powered the dog up and we've now got that holding power with the O-drives controlling those brushless motors with the encoders to hold the position. And I've tuned up the O-drives there with some parameters that you can tune with the O-drive tools I had last time. So far I've tuned all the motors to be the same and we could still further tune those, but we have got pretty decent holding power. But what you'll notice is it's much harder to move the knee joints than it is to move these hip and shoulder joints. And that's pretty much because this distance is much shorter than the whole leg, and so there's much less leverage on that knee, even though the knee takes most of the load, and we saw that in testing. Also, these knee motors get a lot warmer. They're limited to 20 amps, as are all the motors, so we could actually go to 30 or 40 amps on the other motors, but for now, they're all set to 20. So the result of this, of course, is that this sways quite a lot, especially in your rotating on a vertical axis and all the way around. But of course the legs are bolt straight at the moment, so the dogs are the highest point and these leverage angles are the biggest they'll ever be. So we could further tune those O-drives and we can also read force from the joints, which I'll be doing in this video a bit later. So we could try and actively damp that out. Ideally though, we'd have had a higher gear ratio on these shoulder joints, maybe eight or 10 to one, although it's not so easy to fit those pulleys in. So now I've bent the legs and this is how we had it in the last video where I was pushing down and seeing what load it'd take and it seems pretty even there on the front and back. But what you'll notice I've done here is actually position the feet slightly back so that the center of gravity is brought forward and that's mainly to compensate for this piece sticking out of the back. So now I've repositioned the legs to bring that foot forward so it's directly under the shoulder and you'll find it's got much more of a tendency to fall backwards and if I keep pushing it, in fact the legs will give way and it will fall down. So the first thing I'm actually gonna do is go and turn around these back legs so that they're symmetrical and the load is more evenly balanced. So I just wanted to add that those 3D printed pulleys make this build really accessible. They can be printed in PLA. And of course, having that belt round the whole pulley means it grips on multiple teeth. So it means those pulleys will stand up to much more torque than if they were 3D printed gears where only one or two teeth are engaging. So obviously planetary gearboxes will give us a bigger reduction in a smaller space 
but then we've got to make 12 of them and hope the gears don't strip when we go and make the dog jump and do really agile moves. We did some testing last time on that and we're going to do quite a bit more of that this time. So we're going to move these shoulders back so they match the front legs and that gives us better balance and better mass distribution. But it's pretty easy to do. I've made this in quite a modular fashion so we can just literally take this whole leg off and go and switch it round and put it on that side and that will bring the shoulder to the back and obviously switch that one to this side. Now I have made these quite modular in themselves so these places where the pulleys are and the other pivot is they can actually be swapped over and the screw holes are in the same place and they're symmetrical top to bottom so there's no problem with that but actually it's fine because if we move this one over here then the pulleys are on the opposite end already so Going moving it round just means that the pulleys are on the right end, so they'll just still be with the motors fine. So all we need to do really is sort out the cabling, just shift this up on the rails, take the legs off and swap them over, and that's pretty easy to do. Well, that was a pretty easy task. I just swapped the legs over. It took about five minutes. So now obviously we've got these legs, so they're more evenly balanced. And of course the knees bend either way, so I'm going to be walking with the legs posed like this like the Boston Dynamics and MIT Cheetah Dogs, but there's nothing to stop us putting the back legs that way so it's more like an actual dog and walking in either direction in fact or swapping them midway through operation. The dog is sat on its stand at the moment of course and I've got this piece of 2020 here I'm waiting for a longer piece to arrive so I can make the stand symmetrical and that's what the blue tape is about just holding those stirrups on and that is my zero position pose for calibration at the moment on power up but eventually I'll be using absolute position on the encoders or the Z index offset to automatically position those legs so that won't be such an issue. Right it's up with his motor holding power on so yeah, feels a lot better balanced, although it still seems to have more of a tendency to fall backwards, and I guess that's because the knees already partly bent in that direction, so it's more likely to fall that way, so maybe turning those legs inside out would be better. Yep, okay, that feels much better because now the legs are opposing each other, so now it doesn't want to fall in either direction more easily, so... I think that's going to help us quite a bit. That feels much more robust, actually. And what I noticed just then was that this sway is much better than it was. That's actually much more stable. So I guess those opposing knees are actually helping somehow with keeping that, keeping that in the middle. So uh, pretty sure we're gonna run it this way round. So the next thing I do in a project like this is to do the kinematic model so we can move the robot in three axis of translation and three axis of rotation. We did that before with the mini dogs and open dog and that allows us to position the feet in XYZ Cartesian coordinates and it solves all of the motor positions and all of the joint positions in the rest of the leg and keeps all the feet in sync. However, I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm just going to see what we can get out of this. At the moment I'm just feeding positions to this over serial using a USB cable but I can't type in the positions quick enough in order that we can jump and bend the legs and catch itself and test compliance. So I'm just going to make up some timers to feed fixed positions so we can jump and then bend the legs and see if we can jump along and really see what we can get out of the hardware before we do too much more coding. So the first test is just a little jump with fixed timers and fixed positions to bend the legs, straighten them and jump back down and support itself on the compliance of the bent leg. So that seems okay, but what about three in a row on quick succession? And again, these are just fixed timers, so there's no dynamics at all supporting this. So needless to say I'm pretty happy with that, it completely clears the ground. Obviously as I said they are just fixed timers and fixed positions so there's no stability control at all here but you can see it lands okay on its bent legs with a natural compliance and needless to say there's no springs in this system it's just the motor holding power that's causing that spring effect and we can tune that compliance as we did with the previous test dogs so that we could actually make it react to how it lands either the inertial measurement unit data that gives us the tip of the robot or we could read the forces from those legs to see which one hits the ground first. So if it hits the ground on one corner, it could then compensate by either applying less or more force on the next jump to one of the other legs or more of the other legs, or it could actually alter the timing or when it fires those legs to jump and to the positions as well. So there's lots we can do there to actually make that stable. So at the moment the battery is in the front, which means it tends to jump the other way a bit because it's offset, but we could compensate for that in software later. But for now, I'm really happy the hardware is capable.
That was just one thing I wanted to test, to test how fast the legs will move and whether they can pick themselves up and put themselves down completely clearing the ground before it has a chance to tip over. And this is one of the luxuries I didn't have with the previous dogs because they moved quite slowly, at least Open Dog version one, and Mini Dogs, which are called to gear down servos. So they really did have to stay stable if they took two feet off the ground because they actually had to balance on two legs. And at the moment, of course, there's no stability control, no sense of balance. It's just picking its feet up and putting them down really quick. Uh, before it has a chance to tip over. So we can make that much better. Of course, they were coming up to bolt straight legs, which means there's no cushioning on the compliance in between steps. So having bent legs and even more bent legs might have been slightly better, but we'll probably need some stability control for that. The other thing you'll have noticed is this leg here that was closest to the camera wasn't quite at a zero point when it was straight. It was facing forward slightly, and that's because I still haven't sorted out actually zeroing the legs automatically. At the moment, I set them up by eye, to get their zero positions before I power up the O drives and initialize the motors. So we still need to have a look at those encoders. Now I've mentioned about reading force from the joints in this video, and we're gonna talk a bit more about the sensing that we've got here. And that includes the inertial measurement unit, which is the MPU 6050. And that's a little board that sits next to my TNC 4.1, which is the microcontroller for the project. And this is the Adafruit version of the MPU 6050. Now the MPU 6050 can actually combine its accelerometer and gyro data to give me a fairly accurate angle for pitch and roll without me having to do any maths myself. But to use the onboard DMP, we need Jeff Rose Berg's I squared C devlib which is open source and available on github and if we scroll down to MPU 6050 we can find some Arduino examples and the library. One of the really important sketches is the IMU0 sketch and that allows you to calibrate the IMU because they're not all manufactured the same. That gives you some values you put into your main sketch and there's lots of examples here for Arduino for combining that data with the DMP. As usual I've stripped parts out of that example and put them into my own sketch so we've got all of the setup for the MPU 6050. Down in the setup section of my sketch, I've got the offsets from that IMU0 sketch. I've also got another tab, which is the function for actually reading the IMU when the interrupt gets triggered. And now I can just come down into my main loop and I've got a thing here which reads the pitch and roll out of the array. They're in radians, so they get turned to degrees. And then we can just print those out to the serial terminal. I'm using the Arduino plotter there so we can see the pitch and roll and I've got the dog powered up so it's springy on its legs. And you should be able to see if I move that, we've got pitch in one direction and roll in the other direction. So that's a pretty good sensor to work out whether the dog is level or not. And I used the inertial measurement unit data in the Mini Dog 2 project to try and keep it balanced while it was walking, and it balanced on two legs at a time as it was walking along, and it did that by moving all the legs forward and backwards in response to that IMU data. So basically with that motion transposed over the positions the legs were going to go to anyway, and that kept the center of gravity in the right place so it balanced on two legs without tipping either way. So that's useful on flat floor, but obviously if we were to walk up a hill or over obstructions, we're gonna need some other data. Now I've talked about getting the force readings from the encoders and from the legs because we can back drive them with these virtual springs. So we're gonna look at exactly how that could work. I've built quite a lot of force control robot projects in the past, including this robot gripper and a whole robot arm. And what we did typically in this case was had a series elastic actuator and that meant we had the actuator like a servo at one end, then we controlled the joint via a spring looked at the actual joint position and compared the two. And that meant we could work out how much stretch there was on a spring like this piece of bungee cord, and that would tell us how much force we're applying. So if we've got the actuator at one end and the output at the other, they either follow each other or there's an amount of stretch, and that's basically how much force we're applying. But in this case, we don't have any actual springs. So how can we do it? So in our joints, of course, we've just got this belt drive that goes straight from the motor onto the big pulley there that operates the joint, and it's the same in all of them, as I mentioned before. So that means we don't really have anything that stretches in between them and our spring effect is actually coming from the motor holding power and the electronic controller within the O-Drive, which is a piece of software essentially. However, we do know what the demand position is that we've sent the leg to and we can read the encoder at any time using the O-Drive Arduino library. So we can actually work out what the actual position of the leg is and compare that with where we want it to be. So now we've just got data in the serial plotter for the knee joints and what I'm doing there is taking away the difference between where I've sent the knee to and where it actually is. So now we should be able to see if we push down on one of those knees, we get one color there for one of the legs, another one there, another one there, and another one there. And obviously all of them together or however we orient the robot. So that's really just looking at the difference between where the joint is and where we're back driving it to. 
And that of course tells us the force, because the more we push, the more the motor driver wants to push back, so it's a bit like stretching a virtual spring. There are several caveats with that system of course, for instance if we were to jump off the ground, initially when we go and push those legs forward we'll get a massive spike, and that's because the joint position of the actual leg hasn't caught up with the demand yet, so there'll be a massive difference for a short while. Although it does actually take quite a lot of force to jump off the ground, so that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we could selectively look at that data, so we only look at it after the dog has jumped, and the legs have bent again for landing, and then we look at it on the landing to work out which order the legs hit the ground, and we could work out if the robot was misoriented. We could also combine that with the inertial measurement unit to work out that if one leg hit a lump in the ground or hit an object, and the inertial measurement unit was still level, but there was loads of force on one leg, we could work out what's happened and make a decision about the next leg, so we could jump or prong along in a reliable fashion, keeping stable as we go, and of course all of that data needs to be merged in software. The actual force readings will be impacted by how bent the legs are, because if a leg is more bent then it's easier to bend it even more than if it's straight. So actually what we need to do is take into account the kinematic model we haven't written yet, which is going to come up in the next video, so we can actually work out with trigonometry what that force is and how it looks relative to the pose of the leg, and we can take into account the leg bend to keep our forces constant with the actual force that's being applied by gravity or by the mass of the dog or by something else pushing it down. I also wanted to comment on some videos people have been sending me of smaller robot dogs walking around really well, made with radio control servos, and they look like they're about this big, and those look really good, but this is a completely different problem to solve due to the increased mass and inertia and everything else that goes with it, and that's why we need that natural compliance. If you take an object and you double its size in width, length and height, essentially you end up with an object eight times bigger, that means it's got eight times the mass and eight times the inertia. If you double it again then it gets 64 times bigger than the original, and that gives you a much bigger problem to deal with. You can't have a position where the feet are scraping on the ground every so often because it's not perfectly stable for instance, and obviously the power we need to make that dog move is going to be 64 times bigger, and so that's why we've got this issue we need to solve which is been an ongoing problem essentially to have these motors that are agile and fast enough and also that natural compliance so that it's much more forgiving when it walks. So a lot more coming up in this series, I'm feeling really hopeful about this one. Don't forget to like and subscribe and if you'd like to support me through Patreon or YouTube channel membership those links are in the description. Alright that's all for now.